Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather together to worship and to glorify you. Please be with us this morning as we turn to your word. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Let us know more of you. Let us know more of the truth of Scripture, that we may live more and more for your glory every single day. Help me to preach your word faithfully this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, a concept that we're going to see in the book of Jonah this morning from our passage today is that the sailors who were actually in the boat with Jonah were absolutely horrified at the thought of displeasing Almighty God. They did not want to suffer the judgment of God. And this makes us think about the natural heart of the sinner in relation to God. From the testimony all throughout Scripture, we know that the natural disposition, the natural heart of the sinner who has not been saved by grace is to try to make a God out of their own minds. As we see in Romans 1, they worship the creation rather than the Creator Almighty. Instead of the true God who is holy, righteous, and just, the sinner will envision a God who doesn't punish sin, specifically their sins, doesn't punish their sins, never pours out his wrath and only wants the prosperity of every single human being. The sinner in their unnatural and unsaved state will always try to convince themselves that they are just fine before God. They don't need any help. They already have a right standing before him that God would never pour out his wrath upon them. And even if God would pour out his wrath on them, the sinner does not believe that they are on the brink of eternity. They are sure that death and going into eternity is far, far away. Jonathan Edwards preached what is most likely the most famous sermon ever proclaimed on American soil. It was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and it thrusted the North American continent into reformation and revival during the 18th century. In that sermon, Edwards corrects the thinking of the lost man about God and warns him of the danger he is in. The sermon was so powerful that he literally had to stop in the middle of it because people were coming to Christ and literally weeping and wailing because of their sin. Edward says this in that sermon. He says, O sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit, full of the fire of wrath, that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder. And you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to to save yourself, nothing to keep off the flames of wrath, nothing of your own, nothing that you have ever done, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one single moment. Notice how Edwards is going right at the thinking of the lost unsaved man. The lost unsaved man who thinks that they can cling to their own selves or they have something before God to claim. He he goes right at that and he says, no, you have nothing, nothing of your own before God's throne. The truth of judgment poured out by God is incredibly real. It is coming upon all of those who are not in Christ. Every single person should consider their standing before the Lord and be certain that they are in Christ, covered by his blood. Christians of all people know the severity of sin before the holy God and should seek to live righteously before him. The lost should see the truth that the real God is not the God of their imagination. They will not be judged at the final day by the God that they have fought up. They will be judged by the true living God of Scripture. And what we're going to see this morning in Jonah chapter 1 
is that the sailors who were with Jonah actually were more compassionate than him, feared God more than he did, and did not want to sin against God, unlike Jonah, who was running from him. They did not want to be guilty of innocent blood, and we should learn from their example here this morning. Turn with me to Jonah in chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights." So we see here, to bring you up to the context of this passage, that the sailors understand the gravity and the immense danger of this situation that they are in. They have investigated and they have found the source of the problem. They've asked all the questions, they perform their inquisition, and they now have the answer that it is Jonah who has caused this great wrath, this great storm, to be brought about on them. However, they don't exactly know what to do about it in this circumstance. So what do they decide to do? They decide to ask Jonah. They say, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? Now, I think that this shows how bad of a situation the sailors are in in this moment. Why do I say that? Well, they spent time asking Jonah all of these questions they identify Jonah as the problem in this circumstance. They know that he has done evil, that he is guilty, and that the judgment of God is upon him. The sailors, they see that they are in a tough spot because of Jonah. But what do they do? They actually turn to Jonah, who is the source of the problem, and they ask him for the solution here in this circumstance. They want him, who has brought all of this evil upon them, they want Jonah to give them the answer. Now, I have to admit, I'm not for sure that I would have gone to Jonah for an advice had I been in this ship. But let's dig in a little bit deeper here on that point. Why did the sailors go to Jonah? Why did they ask him what they should do? Well, they had found out that Jonah was the problem, so they could have just tossed him over immediately. They could have just tossed him overboard and gone about their merry way. But they don't do that. How come? Perhaps it's because they fear Jonah's God. In verse 10, last week we read where they knew that Jonah was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And they were afraid because of this fact, because Jonah was doing that which was evil. They asked Jonah what to do because they are terrified at the judgment of Jonah's God. This God has brought this horrific storm upon them. They have a front row seat to see the holiness of God and his judgment upon sin. They don't want to displease this God that has sent this mighty storm upon them because of Jonah's sin. They don't want to displease this God by doing something evil in this situation to Jonah. So they're willing to follow Jonah's counsel, even though Jonah is responsible for this entire predicament. Now notice what Jonah tells them to do in verse 12. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now put yourselves in Jonah's shoes here for a second. You realize that you are the reason for this situation. You realize also that everybody else on the ship knows that you are the source of the problem, and they're turning to you for advice in this scenario. Now, if you were Jonah, what would you do? 
Jonah tells them, throw me overboard, throw me into the sea. But doesn't that answer show that his heart is actually still hard towards God? It's interesting to read some commentators on this point regarding whether or not Jonah is actually exercising repentance. It doesn't appear to me that he's exercising repentance at all in this passage. He, he doesn't repent and ask forgiveness until chapter 2, which Lord willing will cover tonight. Instead, it seems as though, obviously, Jonah recognizes he is guilty in verse 12. He understands that he has caused this storm because of the judgment. And he understands that he has done evil before God. And he's even willing to accept the fate for all of these things by being thrown into the sea. But he has not repented, and he will not repent until the next chapter. He knows the men need to throw him overboard because he is guilty. But should he not have been crying out to God in this situation? When the sailors come to him, shouldn't he have just bowed before the Lord and repented and asked for forgiveness in this circumstance? Of course he should have. He should have bowed before Almighty God, recognizing his sin and confessing his sin and asking God to forgive him and repenting of it. And so what does this tell us? It tells us that it is possible for a human being to realize that they are guilty before God, to realize that they have sinned, and yet to continue forward in disobedience and to continue forward knowing their guilt without repenting and placing faith in Christ. You, know, you can know that you are sinning without actually trusting in the Lord. But that's an important point for us to draw out of this particular passage. Think about how this relates to our evangelism for a second. It's not enough for us to go out and to tell people that they are sinners. We must tell them that they are sinners, and we must show them their sin by using the word of God. But we can't stop at that point. It's not enough for us to go out and to tell people that they are sinners, and then to tell them the gospel. We need to tell them those things, but once again, we cannot stop there. We must show them the reality of their sin, we must tell them the good news of salvation in Christ, but we must also call them to actually come to place faith in Jesus and to repent of their sins. There are many people who know that they are not perfect and who know that they have sinned, and they will bust the gates of hell wide open if that is all that they know and that is all that they do, unless they place faith in Christ and repent. The true herald of the gospel, the faithful proclaimer of the word of God, they always tell people the reality of sin. They always proclaim the truth of the gospel, and then they urge people to come to Christ, to place faith in him, and to repent of their sins. Otherwise, the person is no better than Jonah in this passage who realizes that they have sinned but doesn't actually ask for forgiveness. Think about how Jesus talked to sinners. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, what is Christ doing? He, he, he's not just telling the people, you're weary and you need rest. That, that's not all that he's doing. He, he's saying, you're weary and you need rest, and come to me because I am the eternal rest that you need. He is urging them, come to me, place faith in me, find salvation in me. In Matthew 22, Christ is giving the parable of the wedding feast. The king gives a feast for his son and sends out servants to go out urging people. And what are the servants urging? They're urging, come to the wedding feast, Matthew 22, verse 4. Biblical evangelism must always have the call. It must have the thrusting down of the gavel to tell people to come to Christ, that you must actually come. Jonah had a great knowledge of God. Jonah knew that he was guilty before God. Jonah was even willing to be thrown into the sea and to trust his fate to God in that sense. But Jonah did not repent here in this passage of Scripture. He did not ask God's forgiveness for the sin of running away. He did not come, to put it in the language of Christ. 
beyond just our evangelism, think about the application of this truth for the life of each and every one of us in here this morning. The truth is that you must actually come to Christ. You, you must actually place faith in the Lord Jesus. It, it is not enough for you to do a theological study of the Gospels. That, that is a good thing to do, but it will not save you. There will be a lot of people who have read through the Gospels who will spend eternity in hell. It is not enough for you to know that you are a sinner guilty before God. Look, if, if all you do is know that you are guilty, then you are like the cancer patient who knows that they have an illness, who knows that they have cancer, but fails to actually go to get any treatment. That man has knowledge. They know that they need medical attention. They know they have a serious disease. But he will die. That cancer patient will die unless they actually go to the doctor and get the medical attention that they need. So you too will die the death of eternity. You, you will spend eternity in hell unless you actually come to Christ. Uh, look, I am calling for the verdict. Will you come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? W will you be saved or will you be like the man who knows that he has cancer but will not go for treatment? You, you must actually come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You must place your faith in him. You must bow before him as Lord. You must repent of your sins and turn from them and turn to follow Christ. You must actually come to know the Lord and Savior and spend your life worshiping him. You must repent of your sins and not just do a word study on the term repentance. You must actually go through the narrow gate of salvation and not just know about the narrow gate of salvation. But if you do come to Christ, you will be saved. And you will be saved for all eternity and spend eternity serving and glorifying him. Look to him and you will find salvation. Jonah here in verse 12, he has realized that he is the problem. He has told the sailors to throw him overboard. But I want you to notice how the men respond in verses 13 through 14. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they still do not throw Jonah overboard. Instead of all of their energy and all of their might, they try to get back to the dry land. But this storm, it continues raging and fighting against them. This storm sent from the hand of Almighty God will not allow them to come back to dry land. And it's important for us to particularly pay close attention to the response of these men here in this verse. Why? Because they had more compassion for Jonah, who had brought all of this about upon them, who was literally the source of this storm that was about to rip their ship apart, they had more compassion for Jonah than Jonah had for the city of Nineveh that he had been commanded to go and to proclaim the truth of God to. You remember that reading in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4, we saw that Jonah doesn't go to Nineveh because God might actually have mercy upon them. Yet these sailors were willing to show Jonah mercy by not throwing him overboard. What an amazing passage in truth that this shows that the sailors were trying hard to get back to the land to avoid throwing Jonah into the sea because of their compassion upon him. But I think it was more than just their compassion for Jonah that was driving them in this instance. In fact, I don't even think that their compassion for Jonah was the primary motivating force here. The, the primary force is that they do not want God to hold them guilty because of the death of Jonah here in this passage. 
That's the primary reason they don't throw Jonah overboard. They were terrified of the wrath of Almighty God. They knew that the Lord had sent the storm to rebuke Jonah because of his sin. They had a front row seat to the sovereign power of God over all creation. They obviously, as we see in this passage, plainly, they did not want to shed innocent blood before the holy God. Jonah should have felt this way. Jonah should have feared God and been terrified of his wrath upon sin. Jonah should have been horrified at the thought that God would hold him responsible for innocent blood. Jonah would have been guilty of the blood of Nineveh if he had not gone to proclaim to them. If he had never gone to proclaim the message, he would have been guilty of their blood. How do I know that? Well, listen to the words of the prophet, or God's words to the prophet, Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. Ezekiel three sixteen through 19. And at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. So God tells Ezekiel, that if I give you a message to proclaim, and you don't go out and proclaim it, then yes, the wicked person will die for their wickedness, but I am going to require their blood at your hands for your failure to obey my command to you to go out and to proclaim the truth to that sinner, to that wicked person. The person or the group of people, we need to be clear on this, that Ezekiel was called to proclaim to, they would be held accountable. But Ezekiel would be held accountable for blood as well. And so Jonah, by refusing to go to Nineveh, would also most certainly be held accountable for the blood of failing to go to proclaim to those wicked people. How much blood do you think modern-day Christians have on their hands currently for failing to go out and to proclaim the truth of Scripture. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor, that, that, that's just an Old Testament thing, right? That, that doesn't come over into the New Testament. That, that's all done away with, all of that blood guilt stuff. That's right, right? No. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. None of that's done away with. Acts chapter 18. Verses 5 through 6. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Paul considers himself innocent of blood here. Why? Because he had fulfilled his duty to go out and to proclaim the truth of Christ. Therefore, he had no blood guilt because he had done what he had been commanded to. He had discharged his duty as a faithful herald. He had told the wicked sinners about their duty to come to Christ and to find salvation. And their blood was on their own hands, on their own heads for failing to repent and to come to Christ. If Ezekiel, if Jonah would have been guilty of innocent blood for failing to proclaim the truth, how much more do you think that we will be guilty of blood for failing to communicate the truth of the gospel whenever we live after the resurrection where Jesus has already come and laid down his life upon the cross and rose from the dead? These sailors took innocent blood more seriously than Jonah did at this particular point. And I want to urge all of us not to let the pagans of our day take it more seriously than we do as the church of Jesus Christ. I think that the church of America so often fails to understand this point. Many people think that you can come to church, you can sit in the pew, 
and you can be all right. You've done your duty, but that's just not true according to the biblical message. You are saved by faith alone. You are saved through faith alone in Christ alone, but you have a responsibility before the Lord. I'm not saying that every single person in here needs to go out and to become a missionary and to go overseas. We need missionaries. We pray for missionaries to go overseas. But we need people who understand their duty to live here in this moment where God has planted them using the gifts that he has given them and to go out and to perform every single day their duties with excellence and also to proclaim the gospel to those who are lost around them. That is the thrust of what I'm driving at here according to the scripture. That we need to go out, and as we go out about our duties, we need to be involved in both proclaiming the gospel to the lost, those lost who are around us, going out intentionally to meet them, and encouraging the faithful Christians who God has put in our life. That is all our duty. The church has a responsibility to herald the gospel to the lost, and a church that does not do that is guilty of blood before the eyes of God. They have shirked their responsibility and failed to do what is right before the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is not responsible for how the sinner responds. We certainly do not believe that as Christians, that you're responsible once you proclaim the gospel for how the sinner responds. That's not true. But what I am saying is that each one of us in here in the church of Jesus Christ across the world is responsible to proclaim the message of the Lord, the message of the gospel, the message of the entirety of Scripture. A church that does not do that is falling short of its calling before God. A preacher who will not proclaim the truth, but who instead proclaims the ideas of men, has shirked his responsibility and is guilty of blood before God. This is a serious responsibility. This is a responsibility that each one of us will stand before Christ and give an account for how we, how we were faithful or not faithful in this area, just as in every other area of life. And the sailors, they understand the gravity of innocent blood in this passage. And I pray that all of us will take this as a reminder and an encouragement to spur on and to excel still more in this area. Because I am certain that all of us, myself certainly included, can proclaim the good news of Christ and live even more faithfully for him every single day. But these sailors, they see that they cannot get back to the land at this point. They've done everything they can not to, ch not to throw Jonah overboard. And they see that that's not going to work. There's no way they're going to avoid it. And so verse 15 says that they hurl him into the sea and the storm ceases. The sea, it stops, this it stops its raging and the sailors have done what they had to do at this point. Jonah is in the sea and look at verse 16 to see what the sailors do. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So the sailors come to know God through this entire circumstance. They are offering sacrifices to God. They fear him and they know him. This shows the grace and the mercy of Almighty God in this situation. That through all of Jonah's pettiness, all of Jonah's sin and disobedience, God saves these sailors. He uses this entire situation for his own glory, showing his saving power, transforming them. It shows the mighty power of God that he can even use a disobedient, wavering prophet to draw and to proclaim his truth of salvation. But what about Jonah? What happened to him? Well, it's certainly a, a bit of a famous verse now. Verse 17, it ends this chapter in this way. It says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It's interesting because some people, and we'll cover this later on, but some people will actually try to use the book of Jonah to show that God is not in control of everything or that God does not know everything. They'll use especially Jonah chapter 3 for that purpose, and we'll talk about that in more detail later on. But needless to say, we see here that God is in complete control, literally appointing and using a fish for the purpose of swallowing Jonah in this particular instance. 
And Jonah stays there for a full three days and three nights. So in summary, what do we learn from this passage of Scripture? Well, first of all, we see the truth that, as we discussed earlier, you must actually come to Christ. That Jonah knew of his guilt, but Jonah had not asked forgiveness yet. And so, yes, you must know you are guilty. You must see the truth of your guilt before a holy God. But you must actually come to Christ if you are to find salvation. It is not enough for you to know of your sin. You must actually be given the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, who takes the penalty for your sin and who clothes you in his perfection. So that when the Father sees you, he sees you in the robes of the Lord Jesus. The spotless, perfect robes that are without blemish. That your plea before God is not your righteousness because you have none on your own. It is the righteousness of Christ who died for you. And you must actually come and place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn from Jonah's mistake here. Jonah doesn't repent until later. Don't just realize that you are guilty. Actually go and come to know the Savior. Bow before Christ as Lord. And the next lesson that we learn from this passage is that we must take our responsibility before God seriously. The sailors did not want to be guilty of innocent blood, and we must not either. We must have a passion both to proclaim the truth and also to live every minute for Christ's sake. We're proclaiming the truth. We're using all of the gifts that he has given us for his service, both as we go out into the world and as we serve in the local church together. It's all of the above. That Christ has all authority and all power. Therefore, we're called to use the entirety of our lives for his sake. We must have a passion to proclaim the gospel to the lost and do what is right before God in every single circumstance. And it's a responsibility that we must take seriously. And then finally, we see the truth that God can and does act through unusual and difficult situations to save souls for his glory. The sailors in this text come to know God. They fear him and they serve him. And what a blessing that is, that even in this difficult, unusual circumstance, that God uses this moment to draw sinners to himself for salvation. A person can find salvation in Christ even in the middle of difficult and trying scenarios. Therefore, we must be ready to proclaim the truth at all times, knowing that our God is mighty and powerful to save, even whenever it looks hopeless from our human standpoint. That is our duty before the Lord. And if you need to talk about anything here this morning, I'll be standing over here after the service and would love to visit with you or to pray for you in any way that I can. Let's bow together in a word of prayer as Brother Tex comes to lead us in our closing hymn here. Father, thank you for this passage. I ask that you will spur us on to even more passion for you that we would fulfill our responsibility before you. I ask that if there be any here who are lost, that they would not just realize their guilt, but that they would actually come to you for salvation, Lord Jesus. That they would actually come to know you and to find the gracious salvation that you give freely to all who come in faith and repentance, bowing before you as Lord. I ask that you help us to live faithfully before you, to obey everything in your word, and to use every single minute of our lives for your sake. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.